Hi, my name's Joel Cohen. I'm a student of politics at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies um, in London, and I'm the producer and chair of this session, Is This Africa's Decade? Before I start, I'd just like to say um, if one of the speakers runs in late, it's because uh, she was uh, involved in a car crash earlier today, but out of sheer determination is, is still coming, um, but unfortunately isn't here at present. So to start the session, in my experience, Africa is often looked at as a blank slate for Westerners to articulate their fears, from fears about foreign business interests, commercially and both with the rise of China, from fears about opaque governance by big man elites, fears about protecting culture and identity, fears about exploiting natural resources, and the list goes on. Nevertheless, Africa's recent economic success is unquestionable and was, I think, cemented by the success of the 2010 South African World Cup. The IMF says that seven out of the top 10 fastest growing countries of the next five years will be in Africa. And it also predicts that for next year, the average GDP growth will be over 5%, which is well and away from a lot of most developed nations' GDP rates. So does this mean that Africa is finally out from under its colonial shadow? Or will governance problems leave Africans powerless to defend themselves against a new wave of foreign exploitation? In a decade, will we be talking about Africa as we talk about China and India now? Or will it more, look more like the despots of the Middle East? Is Africa the new frontier? Or is it simply a risky place to do business? Is it too unstable? Is the aid or trade debate really over? Can growth survive the economic recession hitting many of Africa's creditors and customers in Europe, the Americas and Asia. To discuss these questions, I'm joined by a distinguished panel of guests and will be joined by one more. Um, to my immediate left is Angus Kennedy, Head of External Relations at the Institute of Ideas and co-producer of the strand of debates that have been going on in this room all day called The Battle for the World. He studied classics at Oxford, linguistics at the University of London, and artificial intelligence at the University of Dundee. Uh, he's also chair of the IOI's Economy Forum, which is uh, helping produce this session. Um, to my immediate right is Christine Thompson, policy manager at SAB Miller. She gained an MA in international relations at Rhodes University in South Africa was working at the South Africa Independent Electoral Commission during the historic 1994 election. She's worked for the European Commission as a public affairs consultant and has a vast range of experience in um, communications and corporate affairs, um, running various projects on alcohol and health issues. To, sitting next to her is Alice Ajay, uh, International Relations Manager at Shell, uh, she was formerly a university lecturer for the Niger Delta Development Agency. She now works for Shell at The Hague, focusing on Nigeria, and she volunteers with the Rotary International Club in Nigeria. Sitting on the very end of the table there is Sam Mendelssohn, who has recently became a DFID Department for International Development, Development Fellow which is a high honour. He's co-founder of Social Performance Advisory, which is a consultancy about microfinance. He's a contributing writer for Prospect. Uh, he's written for African Investor and Financial World magazines. He's also co-author of the microfinance banana skin survey of sector risk about microfinance. We hopefully soon will be joined by Mariam Jame, and I'm just going to introduce her in her absence. Um, to keep things running smoothly. Um, she's CEO of Spot One Global Solutions. She helps IT companies get a foothold in the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. She's also described herself as a blogger, technologist, and social entrepreneur. She's co-founder of the Africa Gathering, which is a big forum for um, entrepreneurs uh, around Africa. She helps organize TEDx, Accra, and Dakar conferences. She's just making her way in now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and she's also an advisor um, on development issues and she has also written for The Guardian. So can I please have a huge welcome to, to all of the speakers. <laughs> Without further ado, uh, each of the speakers have uh, five minutes. Christine, if you'd like to start us off. Great. Um, thanks, Joel. And again, thanks to the um, Institute of Ideas for um, giving um, me the opportunity of speaking here. Um, 
Before I get to the actual point um, of our discussion today, I just want to make one, one broad point, which I think is very important about Africa, which is that it's a continent. It's made up of 50, over 50 countries, and it's not one, one country. And I think quite often there's a problem that Africa can be discussed as a country, and what happens in one country in southern Africa suddenly becomes representative of, of the whole continent. And I think as we have our debate today, we should bear that in mind. I, I'm you know, appreciative of the fact that we're talking about um, broad economic issues, but I do think one of the things that um, Africa has um, suffered from, particularly in discussions about it in the international um, community, is that it has been a victim of sweeping generalizations because people do tend to talk about it as one um, one country, and it's, it's a continent made up of over 50, so I think we should bear that in mind um, as we talk. Anyway, um, you know, I've got a short answer to the question, is this Africa's decade? In my, in my experience, what I would say, yes, economically and in terms of business pros prospects on the continent, I think the signs are extremely good. Statistically, it's extremely easy to make the case that Africa's prospects are looking bright. For example, from a democratic and political point of view, 16 presidential elections have taken place in 2011, and seven more are due in 2012. Economically, the signs are more than encouraging. Since May 2000, when The Economist ran its now infamous edition entitled Hopeless Africa, the continent has absolutely confounded expectations. Economic growth has accelerated in 27 of Africa's largest economies. The inflation rate for the continent has fallen from above 20% in the 1990s to under 10% since 2000. And projections of that growth will remain, on average, above 5% in 2011. That's an impressive record, especially given the dire predictions at the turn of the century. This growth has undoubtedly been fueled by investment. Between 2000 and 2008, foreign direct investment in Africa increased from 10 billion to 88 billion, a figure nearly twice the level of official development aid. During this period, major consumer goods companies such as Procter & Gamble and India's Tata Motors have been moving onto the continent. At the same time, Africa has produced its own businesses and it now boasts 20 homegrown companies with revenues of more than three, three billion. Sectors such as telecoms, banking, tourism and construction are flourishing. Since 2000, for example, telecoms firms in Africa have signed up more than 316 million new mobile phone subscribers, more than the entire population of the USA. And the revenues of Africa's 500 largest companies, excluding banks, have grown at an average of 8.3% a year. What these statistics show is very clear. The world is waking up to Africa's potential. It's discovering that Africa offers great opportunities for business. Let me give you some insights into the business side from SAB Miller's perspective. SAB Miller originates from South Africa. We're the world's second largest brewer and we've expanded into over 70 countries on six continents. In Africa, we now have interests in 36 countries and in the last five years, we've invested almost one and a half billion in our African businesses. We're Africa's biggest brewer and the continent now accounts for 13% of our operating profit. And one of the major factors we see in terms of future growth is the continuing rise of the middle class consumer. When people talk generically, and I sometimes think actually very carelessly about Africa, you hear a lot about corruption, poverty, aid and development, but you don't hear much about the fact that Africa already has more middle class households than India. Or that between 2008 and 2020, Africa consumer spending is forecast to rise from 860 billion to 1.4 trillion. 200 million Africans will enter the market for consumer goods in the next five years. In my view, this is an extremely exciting development, and there's no doubt when you arrive in an African capital like, for example, Johannesburg, Kampala, Lusaka, or Dar es Salaam, that you can feel the energy, dynamism, and momentum that is coursing through these cities. And I'll apologize here for lapsing into a broad and sweeping generalization, but I personally feel that there is an ever-growing sense of Africa being in control of its own destiny, full of confidence, and I think this is a really important and positive point, much less deferential to donors and the international community. And I think this stems from the growth of the middle class, the fact that there's more spending power, and the fact that Africans, courtesy of companies like MTN, Celtel and MultiChoice, are increasingly integrated into the global community by virtue of owning mobile phones and having access to satellite televisions and the internet. 
from SAB Miller's point, we see this, this trend to the extent that our businesses in Africa are increasingly needing to cater for African consumers looking for imported premium beer brands such as Peroni and Grolsch and Miller Genuine Draft. And we're having to focus on meeting more aspirations from the middle class by introducing local premium beer, beer brands such as Nile Gold in Uganda, Mozzie Gold in Zambia and Laurentina Preta in Mozambique. But what about Africa's infrastructure? For the most part, I think it's inadequate. There's investment, investment in functioning ports, good roads, power and water supply is desperately needed. The lack of this kind of infrastructure remains one of the biggest obstacles to Africa's development. In fact, the Africa Development Bank estimates that a shortage of roads, housing, water, sanitation and electricity reduces Africa's output by 40%. Which brings me to my final point. Good governance. Business looks to governments to bring the necessary infrastructure and create the right conditions to maintain economic growth and progress. To flourish, business needs what we refer to as soft infrastructure. That is good governance, the rule of law, transparent regulation, sound property rights, a supportive investment climate, and efficient administration and custom regimes. These depend on good governance and political will. My personal worry is that, in spite of all the positives, political progress does not yet appear to match economic progress. It's worrying that many African leaders are over the age of 70. Some, like Mugabe and DeSantis from Angola, have been in power for over 30 years. And despite the fact that there's a plethora of presidential elections in Africa this year and next, it's not an encouraging sign that for two years in a row, Mo Ibrahim's foundation, which is an African-funded and African-led institution, was unable to find a worthy recipient for the $5 million prize it gives to African leaders who promote development and democracy in their country and hand over power peacefully. So um, on that point, I will close and just make the final comment that um, in my view, the Africa of today is a far cry from the hopeless Africa that The Economist portrayed a decade ago. Economic growth is forecast at 5% or more in 2011 and 2012. And although the impacts of the current financial crisis remain to be seen, economically and in terms of business prospects on the continent, I think the signs for Africa are extremely bright. Thank you very much. Alice? Thanks, Christine. I just want to take it from, from that point. She's talked a lot about the statistics concerning Africa, so I won't go into those details. But for me, as an African and um, a mother of teenage twins, my greatest worry is in certain areas. This could be the decade for Africa, but I worry about certain things. And I want to just take them in three different areas. Governance, she's alluded to that. Civil society education, for me, that's key. Leadership development. And I'm talking about the next generation, not the Mugabe's of this world. Conflict resolution. A lot of things we hear about in Africa are around those various buckets. <laughs> when we talk about governance, what, what am I really talking about? For you to have the kind of growth we're talking about, we need to have good governance. What do you mean when you, when you talk about that? You, need, you mean security of life, security of property, civil liberty, functioning executive, legislature, judiciary, free and fair. And of course, the fourth estate of the realm is the press, free one. You need to also have ability to curtail and check excesses of power. And for you to be able to do this, what do you need? You need good leaders, and I'm not talking about those who are already there. I'm talking about those who have the ability to lead. What do I mean by this? The next generation. I was listening to CNN the other day, and I, I was so fascinated by this young African. She's Ghanaian, has lived around Africa, but now settled in South Africa. The Academy of, um, uh, of Leaders. He, he, he builds up young leaders from Africa. And what did he say? He said he picks them very young. He goes around looking for young ones, 16, 17, most of the time before they get to college. At that age, he goes around, goes to even the camps, the refugee camps, and picks these young ones to be able to develop them to have a vision for Africa. That's what I'm talking about. We still don't have those caliber of leaders to the extent with which we can change things around in Africa. 
this could be our decade. It is economically. But for you to have the sustainable development we're talking about, both the political and the economic have to be working hand in hand and has to be sustainable. For it to be, you must have a group of people who can carry that vision along. So for me, the leadership development of the next generation particularly has to happen on the scale for which Africa can move ahead. Looking at the battle of ideas, I mean, this, you don't need uh, three million leaders to be able to have changes in Africa. I believe that one idea carried along by young, vibrant people can change things around in Africa. It's possible and it can be done. So I don't think that it is as unattainable as we may look at it. Now, looking at um, civil society education, when I was growing up, the curriculum I had, I'm, I'm Nigerian, so as she said, if you look at Africa, a lot of people think it's one country. Several countries make up Africa, east, west, north, south, southern. So you have nuances around Africa. When I was growing up, we had in our curriculum what, what they call civics. And that meant that you had to understand your role in the society. I don't see that anymore. I'm a teacher originally, and that really pains me. I follow my kids' schooling very closely, so I know what is there, what's no more there. And that used to teach us what your role was in the society. You had to pay tax, you had to vote, and things like that. I know that in Nigeria, for instance, 2011, for some who are about my age, who are in my generation, you don't need to guess my age, I'll tell you. I'm 49. This is the first time some voted because they were able to see the reason for their voting. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. People who don't understand why they should vote because their votes don't count. This time some said, we'll vote and our votes will count. And that comes from education, civil society education. Then of course you have to pay taxes. That's part of your civic duty. Many don't pay taxes because they say why? What's, what's the point? When I pay tax, somebody else steals the money. So why do I have to pay anyway? And they turn around and blame the government for not fixing the roads and so on and get others to come do it for them. So what I'm saying is civil society education is critical for us to have that mass that we need to be able to change Africa, to have that vision that we're looking forward. So there's leadership, there's followership. Follow followership is as important as leadership as far as I'm concerned. It's easy to blame the leaders, but we as followers, immediately you find yourself in that leadership position, you do even worse than the Mugabe's of this world. That's what we found in Africa. Conflict resolution, that's another area. What you hear about mostly is about conflicts in Africa. For me, that's another key area, and you need peace and development to be able to do that very well. Now, that's an area that I think has to be taken very seriously as Africa and as Africans. And it, can be done, it can't be done from outside. We internally have to do it. We have ECOWAS, we have African Union and all that. So we have some of the structures in place to be able to bring this about. How well are these functioning? That's another question. But what I'm saying is those issues need to be looked at from those angles before we can talk about a sustainable growth for Africa. Economic sustainability is not enough. Political sustainability has to go hand in hand with economic sustainability for us to have what we need for Africa to say this is their decade. Thank you. Thank you. And Sam? Uh, thank you, and to Joel and to the IRI <coughs> for having me here. My focus will be more on uh, finance, financial literacy, and how I think that technology and innovation are transforming lives in Africa, and how fair and inclusive uh, financial services are necessary, although by no means are sufficient. Uh, component of development in Africa. This will be the remit of the fellowship, which is just starting, and thanks for the, what you said. Um, I'm going to give a, a few examples of uh, what's working and some examples of challenges as well. Trends generally, um, there's an enormous amount of technological innovation going on in African financial services. Anyone who's been to an African city, you, would, you will see some examples of this. 
Uh, M-Pesa is probably the most well-known, and many in this room may be familiar with it. I'll, I'll come back to that. But there's orange mobile money, new remittance models, Zane's Zap. Obviously, there are big macro trends that have already been talked about. I mean, you know, China's involvement in major infrastructure projects, but also in terms of the products, the cheap products that are making financial services more available. And I'll come back to that as well. So financial services is not just about um, microfinance at all, and it's definitely not about microcredit, which has had um, so much negative press in the last year. It's as much about improving financial literacy, financial access, and education. Uh, so a few examples of financial innovation, and let's bear in mind there's a low starting point. Africa has by far the lowest financial access of any region in the world. 15 to 20% of Africans overall have a bank account. Andhra Pradesh, the state in India where so much of the microcredit troubles have been, has more microfinance clients than the whole of Africa, which has roughly a billion people. There have been many legitimate criticisms, as you may know, about microfinance, and it's been exposed as not the development panacea that many had claimed for the last 30 years. And we all know that just giving credit or debt as it is to the poor is not necessarily a development intervention. In fact, it can be counterproductive. And so the, the trend within my area, this area, is towards credit plus. It's about incorporating fair credit with savings, remittances, models, mobile banking, and particularly uh, suitable insurance so that people can protect themselves from, from shocks. And so we're, we're thinking about models that provide for the establishment of financial institutions at all levels of the pyramid that allow MFIs, microfinance institutions, to graduate into banks and uh, give banks incentives to compete for the, the lower income markets. As Christine said, mobile phones are the, the huge thing. You can't get away from them in Africa. There are four or five hundred million, maybe six hundred million mobile phones. In the cities, most people have at least one. You, you go to Africans in all countries, in the number of providers and calling cards and credit sellers, and they've grasped the mobile phone like, like really no one else. Um, there have been globally 78 money, mobile money ventures worldwide. There are another 83 in the pipeline. These are different figures. But half of these have been uh, in Africa, over 20 countries. Uh, and Pace is a great example. It's a much discussed one, so maybe you're sick of hearing about it. But this started with some differed money about five years ago, a small amount of money given to Vodafone. Vodafone owns Safaricom, and they piloted this program called M-Pesa, which is mobile money, where you can carry money on your mobile phone. You can go to an agent and get money. You can deposit money. There are security reasons. It's great for person-to-person -person banking, remittances. It has been a success beyond anyone's wildest dreams. There are now 12 million active customers of M-Pesa in Kenya, in a country with 30 million people. That's more than half the adult population, three times the number of people with a bank account, transacts, and this is worth thinking about, $415 million a month in P2P payments, equivalent on an annualized basis to 17% of Kenya's 2009 GDP. This is one company, one platform. There are 350 business users in Kenya uh, alone, companies that use M-Pesa to pay their staff or pay for services. Um, there are the the... There are plenty of other examples. The $50 Chinese smartphone, which is almost there when it comes in, is going to provide incredible new opportunities for farmers to use apps to look at weather, to look at commodity prices, to be able to see who's got what in the local market, to be able to coordinate with each other. This is almost there. 3 g is been rolling uh, across. This is, this is going to change a lot. There are some case studies that I wanted to go through, but there's not going to be uh, time. But like Equity Bank in Kenya, Barclays, what they're doing in, in Ghana different types of microinsurance, I mean, which is so important because it's a crucial irony that those people who are most likely to be affected by shocks, uh, drought, famine, uh, disability, strife, are also the most likely, so the most people who are most affected by them are also the most likely to suffer them. So we have to design fair insurance packages and there are lots of exciting things happening. The con can I just conclude quickly? Yeah. The, the, the question is, is this Africa's decade and, and my answer is a strong but qualified yes um, you know people are incredibly sophisticated in their use of financial services and it's important to understand they just do things in a different way and 
you know, I, I just want to quote from the Africa Progress Report, uh, which Kofi Annan uh, wrote the forward to recently. When it comes to economic growth in Africa, three issues stand out. Africa's comparatively swift and broad recovery from the global financial crisis, which I'm sure we'll talk about more, is continuing dependence on narrow commodity-driven growth, I'm sure we'll cross as well, and only, and its positive growth outlook. Uh, this very well outlines, I think, the challenges, and I hope, well, I hope we can talk more about financial services as well. Thank you very much. And um, Mariam, would you like to give us your five minutes? Thanks. Thanks for having me. So, you guys, do you think this is the Africa decade? No? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. I think I'm more interested in the, the people of Africa. So I go to Africa, I see people in Africa. So I think my take, what I'm trying to say here is that the, is, is this a decade of Africa? I would say no, not yet. Um, it has been the Africa decade for quite a long time. But I'm, I'm, I'm sure you guys are very tired in listening to the African stories, what's happening in the continent. Um, I think what we need to bear in mind right now is that the, the people of Africa are doing amazingly well. Everywhere you go in Africa, people are doing fantastically. And they, they, you know, they, they want to have access to information. So maybe we're sitting in London here right now talking about, is this a decade of Africa or not? I don't know. I don't know if it is a decade or not. But one thing I know, my guys out there, our people in Africa, they're doing amazingly well. They're working extremely hard. Okay? Now, the good news is, my idea is that I, I, like, I, I don't like the negative narratives about Africa, what we hear here in London. <laughs> Africa this, Africa that, Africa this, Africa that. So we need to tell the good stories about Africa, what's happening on the ground. So we need to talk about IHUB, for example, in Kenya, where amazing entrepreneurs, amazing Af so Af uh, Kenyan developers are sitting down right now, developing amazing solutions used by the New York Times, the Ushahidi team, amazing people. So those are the people of Africa I'm talking about. So when you go to Tanzania, for example, you've got people who are amazingly nurses, they're working very hard, so they're developing the country. So I'm not an economist, I don't like statistics, and you know, I'm, I'm against the NGOs, I don't like the NGOs. Sometimes all those uh, statistics are wrong, because when you, go to the ground, when, you, when you go on the ground, you know, it's completely, you know, it's just to make their reports nice, and web, flashy websites, it's fantastic, it's cool. When they come back to London, they show all that, so they can have money from the donors. So, my take is, there are, we need to talk about the good stories about Africa. So you guys need to go on the ground and see what's happening out there when you come back and you can tell the good stories. Now, I'm seeking, about, I'm seeking the narratives about Africa because for many years, 80 years after colonialism, we are now sitting down talking about Africa. This Africa does, so we show the BBC showing good stories about Africa. So when there's a Horn of Africa, they show about, the, you know, they show about those kids who are dying, they need money and donation. So that doesn't stop the progress of Africa, because if when you go on the ground, you see the people who are making it, okay? The diaspora, people who've been studying in the West for many, many years. They have good skills, they are going back to their countries of origin, and they are making amazing, they're making investment, they're building up businesses in the continent. Now, when you go to Kigali right now, where Paul Kagame is there, maybe people don't like him in the West because he's very strong, He's making a difference in his country right now. Technology is booming in Rwanda right now, okay? Now, my, what I'm trying to say in a, in a very, very short, I'm more interested in the people of Africa. So for you, you need to make up your mind if you want to find out if this is the decade of Africa or not. For my view, it's not the decade of Africa yet, but the people of Africa are making it happen. So in the next 10 years, you'll see the continent booming. So we are amazing in Africa. So, you know, for me, I'm, what I'm saying to the African people, start blogging, start talking about your continent, blow your own trumpet, because if you don't do it, someone else will. So I think here, we're making the, the things very, very wrong. So, you know, let's just, let's just let the continent progress. Let's Africa progress. Let's talk about Africa in a very positive way, okay. because okay. there are things happening out there. Great, and finally, Angus. Um, thanks, Joe. I mean, as a Canadian and a classicist, I suppose it was inevitable I got picked to talk on the African economy, so I'm going to go for the um, broad sweeping generalizations, to, so forgive me, but I suppose my basic argument is that uh, the next decade uh, could be uh, Africa's in terms of economic growth, um, but almost that its ability to uh, grasp that opportunity uh, will be in direct proportion to its ability to throw off uh, the influence of a lot of the kind of uh, negative uh, ideas 
that are much more uh, predominant uh, in the West, the kind of a, a Western thinking, particularly around hostility to economic growth and fear of population increase, uh, could lead, if those kind of ideas are taken on board in Africa, could lead to Africa failing uh, to take uh, what really is a, an historic uh, opportunity uh, to transform itself and in the process uh, probably transform the world. So my basic argument has been that it has been growing. Uh, I'll go into some of the figures on that. It could continue to grow uh, at a very rapid and transformational level of development, but there is a real danger of it being held back, not just by the overall uh, economic climate we're, we're all suffering from, but by attitudes that are uh, hostile to growth, uh, hostile to population growth, uh, environmentalist concerns and in particular the vested interests of a lot of Western observers and Western NGOs which would much prefer uh, Africa to continue to stay uh, relatively dependent and it, it'll be the job of Africans to uh, challenge those attitudes uh, if it is to, to emerge. I, feel, I suppose at least this week one part of my argument has been made a bit easier as President Sarkozy has hoisted a big for sale uh, sign over Europe with the for sale sign uh, facing east. So the argument that uh, Africa is only benefiting from Chinese uh, neo-imperialism doesn't seem to hold that much water anymore. At this rate, Europe uh, will be Chinese long before uh, Africa will. But there are marked contrasts, I think, to um, what's going on, in, what has been going on in Africa and what's going on in Europe. Europe, as we've been discussing today, ravaged by sovereign debt crises, by riots here in London, by uh, occupations of uh, St. Paul's, austerity programs. On the one hand, Africa on the other hand, most of it, relatively balanced books economically, benefiting from uh, capital inflows uh, for a number of years uh, and boasting pretty robust, robust growth figures that we heard about uh, from Christine. William Wallace uh, writing an AFT uh, back in August made the point, uh, you know, slightly flippant, but let's take it on board, that even crime-ridden Lagos has never seen riots like we had here in London uh, back in August, and nor do we see growth rates uh, here in London like we see uh, in Africa. In the last 10 years, fully six of the top 10 world growth rates were in sub-Saharan Africa, with Angola at 11.1% put China into second place. So the last 10 years, averaged out, Angola has been the place to be, not China. The predictions for the next uh, six years have seven African countries in that top ten list worldwide. Ethiopia, Mozambique, Tanzania, Congo, Ghana, Zambia, and Nigeria. The other three in the top ten are China, India, and Vietnam. So absolutely no place uh, for any Western country in the top ten. And Standard and Chartered uh, predicts average annual growth rates of 7% over the next 20 uh, years in Africa. Now, Sounds great. Of course, Africa only uh, is 2% of the world's output economically, so you are starting from a very low base, and it is easy to uh, grow fast. But it does have a transformational effect. 7% year on year over 20 years will absolutely transform uh, Africa. Just look at what's happened in China, where growth rates at a similar level uh, have taken 300 million people out of poverty uh, in the last 20 years. So that's all on the good side. The but, and of course the, the, there's a but, is that uh, Africa may not um, grasp that opportunity. Uh, I don't know if people saw, uh, there was sort of a news night special going on this week, and I think it was uh, Tuesday night, there was a feature on, on Zambia, and uh, uh, foreign investment allowing large-scale uh, commercial fa farming in Zambia. And the point made, again optimistically in that report, uh, was that not only um, if Africa were to achieve productivity levels in farming at only 80% of the world average, not only could Africa feed itself, um, but it could feed, it'd become a net exporter of food if it, if it reached that level of productivity, which, you know, I think is very positive. Then they turned very quickly to the but in this Newsnight report, uh, which was but large-scale intensive farming damages to the environment, but it's capital intensive, but it displaces subsistence farmers, right? So subsistence farmers will lose their uh, jobs. Uh, even more than that, they're argued they will lose their identity, uh, which is somehow rooted in the practice of being a subsistence farmer, uh, and that African countries might want to be very careful and circumspect about encouraging this kind of level of productive growth in farming. To the extent, I mean, these are not just Western arguments being applied to keep Africa back. The uh, vice president of Zambia, Dr. Guy Scott, was interviewed <coughs> in this program. 
And he said about his own country, the main problem uh, for Zambia is its population. Uh, its own population is the problem. Why? Uh, because it's about four times too big for the economy. So he says, from now on, we will very, be very, very circumspect about allowing more land deals to be done because they might throw people out of jobs. Now, that might sound very uh, uh, full of concern uh, for subsistence farmers who might um, be faced with the future of not being subsistence farmers anymore, which to me, I mean, I don't, I don't want to gloss over the fact that some people may, may lose their jobs, but growth in any economy, productive growth in any economy will create uh, job opportunities elsewhere, uh, higher skilled jobs, higher paid jobs. And the argument that they should stay in subsistence farming seems to me a kind of, we went through this process in the West once, but we're going to pull the ladder up now, and what is good for Africans is to stay sort of poor, um, which I would very much like Africans to challenge and reject those kind of ideas. Another example of it I saw this week is a poster on the tube at the moment. It's an Oxfam poster um, called um, Home is Where the Bulldozers Are. And it has a big picture of bulldozers and uh, sort of subsistence farmers uh, running away from them. And again, land deals are said to be ruining uh, the hope of people in Africa for a better tomorrow. And I just thought, well, Oxfam would say that, wouldn't it? I mean, is, is it not sort of part of Oxfam's raison d'etre right, for Africans to say to stay as poor subsistence farmers? Because otherwise, Western uh, aid NGOs would be out of a job. Let's face it, maybe that's something we, c we can discuss. But again, very hostile to the idea of transformative development uh, happening. And it reminded me of that quote uh, of Tony Blair back in 2001, that the state of Africa is a scar on the conscience of the world, but if the world as a community focused on it, we could heal it. Well, A, I don't like the idea of seeing Africa as a sort of a wound that needs to be healed by somebody else. Africa is full of potential if it, if it asserts its independence and autonomy. And that idea is uh, Africa as being the responsibility of the world uh, to be healed, I think, continues the kind of Western view of it as a hapless child on the one hand and as a dark, scary continent on the other. I mean, the, the more kind of uh, positive gloss that's put on this way is that the West now has a responsibility to facilitate, to empower, and to capacity build in Africa. But again, I think that's deeply uh, paternalistic and patronizing when you strip, uh, strip away uh, the veneer. And I'd, just to finish, I, I, I think, um, Africans should really ignore these arguments and to look to what has been achieved economically, and some of the other panelists mentioned it over the last 10 years. Uh, Africa is a big continent, uh, but it is getting smaller. Uh, new air routes are opening up all the time. There was a, a time not too long ago that if you wanted to go from east to west in Africa, you had to go via Paris, which was crazy, right? There are now uh, direct air routes opening up run by Egypt Air, South African Airways, Royal Air Morocco, Kenya Airways, Ethiopia Air Airlines, and so on, which are shrinking Africa. Uh, and creating much greater pros prospects uh, for its population. Again, the second uh, most populous country in the world with 20% of the land area, which could really uh, be a hugely transformative effect on the whole of the world if it, if it, if it um, pushes forward. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to start by asking, sort of taking Angus's final comments and putting them to Mariam on this side of the table. Um, Angus said... Um, we can't heal Africa, but you said, Mariam, that um, you know, if we just start thinking about the positive stories of Africa, if we start thinking better about Africa ourselves, is it, is it just a PR problem that, that we're not getting the right PR and so we see Africa in a specific way? And that if we just thought about it differently, things could change. Is that, do you think that would help Africa? I mean, is that the, the only thing that Africa needs? I think the problem we have that here in the West, uh, we, we don't know much about Africa. And when you go on the ground, you see the, the real stories about what's happening in the continent. So I think here we are bombarded with negativity and it has been, uh, you know, has been like this for, for many, many years. So we don't have, there is no, I've been trying to talk about this, you know, a couple of weeks ago, the, 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 we don't have a PR company for Africa. So everybody talks about Africa as they want to talk about Africa. Uh, this is the this is the real problem for us. So now it's up to the the cheetah generation. I call them, the the African people, the people who cares about, who understand what's happening in the continent, to come and talk about the stories about Africa, to share those stories, and the friends of Africa, the people who are here in the West and in other places, to share those ideas, 
with the African people. That's why the Africa Garden Platform was, was funded, to help these people understand what's happening in the continent. Because, you know, if you have always negativity, you, you, you can't progress, and that's what we have. The, that's what the problem we have in Africa. We lot of negativity, and there are wrong stories actually. There are absolute wrong stories in the continent. You know, you never hear about the good stories that happen in in in, in Nairobi, in in Senegal, for example. You, you never heard them. Every time you come here, you hear the you land to Heathrow Airport, you just hear negativity. And I think the the NGOs, you know, I kind of like sometimes. I, I think Oxfam. I don't agree. I think Oxfam is kind of like trying now to. You know, to change the, the, the methodology, the way they, they tackling, you know, what they're doing in Africa. There are some NGOs who are good, but there are some micro NGOs, those little NGOs. They're the one who actually destroying the continent and, the, you know, they, they're the one who's doing that. I'd also like to ask Sam, you went into quite a lot of detail saying, um, giving examples of how Africans have been given access to credit in, in more ways than ever before. Um, but I'd kind of like to try and get a bit deeper and ask um, why do they need the access to the credit in the first place? Like what has changed in Africa that has made it so um, dynamic and created a, a, a plethora of new means for which economic activity can thrive that weren't there before? Well, before I answer that, I mean, I totally endorse uh, Angus's point about that there is a uh, there's a, a an NGO global industry that has a vested interest in the status quo here. I mean, it's, it's an important point. I think that um, access to fair, sustainable financial services is, I think it's a, a basic, if not a primary, then a secondary human right. And I think a lot of people are coming to understand that. Um, credit is part of it when it comes to microenterprise, but seeing if you go to you know slums and you see 500 women in a row all selling the same tomatoes for the same price that's not an economy um there's uh, there's a a town uh called Capute that's been built by an mfi outside nairobi and uh it was designed by a woman called ingrid M uh, munro but she's a city an urban planner and uh, not a, a banker. And what it's done is it's created this isolated little microeconomy where to encourage people to move from the slums into these very nice homes. And that's all laudable, but it's been a catastrophic failure. And the reason is microenterprises alone, isolated from my access to markets, is not sustainable. And I think that every um, country that's ever succeeded has has done so by the creation of a middle class and that means having small and medium enterprises and you get small and medium enterprises mm -hmm. from uh, affordable access to credit to people who have an idea not everyone i mean it's it's ludicrous to think that anyone who's given a 200 hundred dollar loan is a natural entrepreneur but uh, having access to credit is important. Access to savings is crucially important. And as I mentioned before, I think that being able to you know, put aside money for tuition, it, it, it impacts on everything, on health, on education, the ability to manage one's but finances. My, my question is more uh, why now element? What's so dynamic about Africa now that it needs all of this credit that it didn't have a capacity to use before? Well, I think it always needed it but microfinance in its modern incarnation is 30 or 40 years old part of it is technology part of it is other businesses coming in and mainstream banks uh trying to reach down to the bottom of the pyramid i mean i'd be open to what any anyone else thinks on that but it's not like it's not like it was a, um people never needed financial services before it's just now something that's really starting to happen great and um christine and alice you both talked um about the development of African infrastructure in, in your own ways. Christine was, um, I think, t talking more economically about transport, communications, and the like. Um, and Alice was talking uh, more about uh, sort of cultural and social capital and the need to develop state institutions that can develop institutions that can help Africans. Um, but I'm kind of wondering what you think is, should be the, who should be responsible for um, producing that infrastructure, uh, how comfortable you would be with um, businesses uh, helping African development and how much you think the governments of African countries play um, their role in responsibility for creating infrastructure. Before I answer that, just to say something about what Sam said, microfinance is 
absolutely essential in Africa. It's very useful. I'll give you a little example. As um, a Rotary club, we had as this woman who sells um, fruits just around my street, and um, a few others like her. We gave them very little money, and that's important. They have to be entrepreneurs already. It helps. You don't give to people who are um, portfolio carrying entrepreneurs, those who are already in the business and whose business can grow. So these people are giving very little money, but they have to be in a group of 10 women, given little money to improve their business, and it's a revolving loan. So when you pay back, you get more. And they put pressure on each other to pay so that they can get more. And their businesses grow, and a lot of these women, one of the hidden resources in Africa are women. Very important. These ones use that money to train their kids. I know a lot of women who bring up their children just on that tomato you're talking about, the fruits and so on. A little money, they train them. Where I come from, education is so important, so they'll do anything. But should they continue to do it privately, or does the state, do you think the state... Yeah, I'm, I'm coming to that. That's critical, so we can't um, overlook that. But the state has its own functions, and the government have their own roles to play. That's why I said civics when I was growing up. The government has its role, you also have your role. But how are these roles being played? Both ways. How well? That's the issue. A lot of times you find that some of these issues, the governments don't do as well as they should their own roles. They don't play those roles as well. That's why you have infrastructural development, for instance, the world over. That's a governmental role. Of course, the private individuals, private sector, contribute. But essentially, that's a governmental role. And I find across Africa, with exceptions, of course, there are nuances here and there, the governments have failed this money in that area. So when you find a lot of these things happening, well, if you look properly, probably the private sector has come in in a lot of those cases. But it doesn't mean they don't do anything, but what I'm saying, they don't play their roles as well as they should. So that's, that's very important that, that we, we, we note that. Yeah. Christine? I think you've said everything I would really want to say on that. Um, you know, from our perspective, absolutely, you know, business looks to government um, to provide the necessary infrastructure. And I think it is true that in developing markets and emerging markets, Africa, um, particularly in Africa, and um, business does step up to the plate and fill in gaps where, where governments aren't able to, to um, play a role. I mean, I just look, for example, at um, issues around HIV and AIDS, um, there is an expectation that business will play a social role and have a very social um, a social role in 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 countries where, where they operate um, so yeah I would absolutely say that business looks to government to provide the necessary infrastructure but in Africa I think there is an expectation that business will step up to the plate and and play a broad broad role um, in society um, there's another point I want to make which I think we've touched on and which I think seems to be a theme coming out here which is um, the perception versus reality issue around around Africa and, and I mean I, I say this I mean I'm a, a Zimbabwean I have um, family who still live, live there and you know I think Zimbabwe is one of the countries that's had you know some of the worst press and has actually you know Africa's been tarred with with Zimbabwe's <coughs> problems in, in many cases as a sort of broad and um, brushstroke and it always strikes me when I go back how different the, the reality is to the perception and there's such a normality going on there and yet when I'm out of the country I, I get the sense that things are absolutely out of control <laughs> and there are obviously problems and so on but I think the point I want to make and I, I think you make it very well is that when you hear things about Africa from external and then you go back the difference is, is quite um, dramatic and I, I think that is something that the continent has struggled with in, in many ways is this issue around perception versus reality and um, I think it is a broad theme that, that plays out in the international community about Africa. Okay, thank you. Um, and finally, Angus, I'd like to ask you on a more geopolitical level, do you think that there's a space for African politicians to negotiate a space for themselves between uh, the East and the West? You mentioned <coughs> France turned, putting up the for sale sign. What do you think would have to happen in order for African Africans to attract that that business? Some of it may may happen uh, inevitably as a result of uh, economic growth in Asia, right? So, uh, rising uh, in domestic consumption uh, and wage increases in in China and Vietnam, for example, may well uh, create 
um, replacement jobs in Africa, so lower uh, wage jobs that the Chinese won't do anymore. So there can be kind of a positive economic uh, cascade around the world in that respect. But um, there's one thing I just wanted to say. I mean, I think a lot of times when people look at this problem about the prospects for Africa, uh, people get either labelled into one of two camps, either kind of crazy dreamers like me who says that all Africans can have Western living standards even if the West doesn't want them and relatively quickly, uh, or people get labelled um, not as dreamers but as sort of free market fundamentalists that are just out to sort of uh, rape Africa uh, again. But I think people, when, when they characterise it in that way, miss an important point because everybody seems to agree, talking about Africa, that there should be aid, that there should be fair trade. Everybody goes on about the problems of corruption and good governance and uses it as an excuse to sort of lecture uh, African uh, countries on how they behave. Um, and everybody is hostile <coughs> to transformative changes at the macro level. <coughs> you hear all this stuff about microfinance, uh, really careful changes. And the word you hear all the time <coughs> is sustainable development, mm. which, apart from being a complete contradiction in terms, is something that if you think about it, you just don't want. Emotionally, when, when you talk, actually. Yeah, it's <laughs> hypocritical, maybe. But um, when you talk about uh, an economy, the only thing you want is unsustainable development, mm. right? And I've been racking my brains to think of an example. The only area in life I can come up with so far, maybe other people can think of one, but the only area I can think of where you want sustainable development is a tumor, right? If you've got one, you just don't want it to grow anymore. So that would be good to keep it under control. But for an economy, unsustainable development, and I think that's what Africans should be arguing for. Great, and thank you very much. And we're now going to come out to the audience. I just wondered uh, if the panel would care to comment on Britain's role in, uh, and the United Nations' role in holding back development in Africa. Um, I told my friends that the Department for International Development was responsible for £1.2 million worth of uh, hunting rifles and flat screen TVs being bought by the regime in Sierra Leone. This is not to uh, have a go at you, sir, just at your sponsors. Um, and I wondered, you know, am I alone in thinking that not just NGOs, but the British government is alive and well in enforcing corruption, canoodling with corrupt people, and as well as what Angus refers to, this uh, silly logic of sustainable development. Perhaps an even more important point, just uh, this last 10 days or so, is the United Nations report on the seven billion, where uh, they quote John Cleland, commander of the British Empire at the London School of Tropical Medicine, saying that high fertility rates impede economic growth. And, you know, it's an article of faith with liberals and The Guardian in this country that the United Nations is always right. Um, when are we going to pillory those people for their Malthusian approach, uh, you know, to population in Africa, which actually can multiply the number of working days and therefore the wealth of that continent? If Africa has a PR problem in the West, does it really matter? I mean, clearly we're not that important anymore. Uh, to what's going on in Africa. So uh, apart from it not being very nice that people don't think highly of Africa uh, over here, is it actually causing real problems in Africa for Africans? Or is it just, you know, these stupid Westerners having stupid ideas about things and not really knowing what's going on? And also, possibly more importantly, um, thinking about um, industrial revolutions and, and, and development, very rapid development in, in Britain, in Europe, in China, I mean, these things do have casualties. I'm all for them, but they have had, uh, you know, negative effects as well as positive ones, and often the very poor, at least initially, do suffer. Is there anything that can be learned from those processes in in, in those countries in the past and currently going on in, in places like China and India uh, that that Africa could could learn from in a way and, and maybe mitigate some of those casualties in its own uh, rapid development? Uh, I just wanted to know that uh, I completely agree with you on the fact that. Uh, civil society education and leadership development are very important for emerging countries, for the youth of emerging countries. Uh, but in regards to not Africa, but uh, your, your country, Nigeria, what pragmatic steps can be taken in, let's say, the next five years to actually develop those fields, uh, civil society education and leadership development? I'm a bit surprised that we've heard nothing really much more than um, the plethora of mobile phone take-ups and microfinance, um, which I can't believe have got very much to do with 
the massive amount of growth that we've seen. So I'll be really interested to hear more um, on what has really fueled that growth and what we can learn from that. Secondly, I do disagree that the problem is sort of micro NGOs. All the big NGOs, and I don't think this has got anything to do with them having a vested interest in keeping Africa poor, all the big NGOs are anti-growth and against people in the developing world having what we have. And I do think it's not for Africans to come here and tell stories about what they want. It's for us to go and tell the truth in this country and where we live that Africans are not different from us. And of course they want the good life like anyone else. And I think it's beholden on us to challenge the NGOs and their sustainable in that way. Third point, I do uh, thought Christine's points were really interesting. The first half of what you said, uh, Christine, but then you seem to err on what I would call the corrupter babble, where the solution seems to be, you know, governance and rule of law and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, which sounds like the usual Western apology for the lack of investment and the lack of taking Africans and their capacity to run society seriously. And it's, it's just preaching. And I really think we should ditch this corruption nonsense. I was struck by three things. One of them was when Alice talked about the women and the entrepreneurship of uh, tomatoes in Nigeria. And I did wonder why something struck me about the fact that it was women and tomatoes in Nigeria and not oil or byproducts of oil. The other thing was that, um, sorry, I've got to think for a minute. No one seems to have touched on the panel uh, things like famine, AIDS, genocide, um, you know, malaria, things like that. And I just wondered if we could have some comments on that. And thirdly, um, Angus, I think you have to have the trophy for running the Institute of Ideas party line, followed by massive generalizations, which uh, Christine had earlier alluded to. It is very dangerous to make sweeping generalizations. Thank that, you. Yeah, that's my speciality. Yes. Um, so Christine, if you want to want to come back to the questions. Well, I'll, I'll just answer them um, quickly. And, um, you know, I think the point I made earlier is that the growth has been fueled by investment and the fact that between 2000 and 2008, investment in Africa has increased by 10 billion to 88 billion. And I think, you know, the point that I'm actually trying to make is that business is really a huge driver of what, what is... Um, transformed Africa really and you know the fact that you do have so many homegrown com companies now and I think it, it, it's that is the point that I was trying to make and, and if I lapsed into what you term as the old the old narrative um, I apologize for that because I, I certainly don't mean to I mean I am very optimistic about what's happened but I think you still have to look at the issues the fact that um, you do have people in power who well, I think probably the better way of looking at it is governance issues, leadership issues. And Alice, I think you made the point is where are the young leaders coming from? Where are we seeing people who are going to drive a new vision from Africa? People who are 40 and, and are talking for Africa rather than um, leaders like Mugabe or Museveni or Dos Santos who've been in power for many, many years. And I think that's the point I was really trying to make around that. Um, I'm certainly very anti-talking about corruption and all of those those issues because I think they rehashed and they, they are um, what I would describe as the old narrative and, and what I've really tried to put across today is the fact that Africa's booming and you know business is benefiting from that jobs are being created you know um, farmers are being pulled out of um, subsistence farming at SAB Miller we've got 40,000 farmers in our, in our supply chains and that's what we're looking to do, is create positive opportunities for people. And I think it comes from business, it comes from enterprise development. And um, I would certainly not want to um, rest and, and, and um, talk about the corruption, because I think that's been dealt with you know, in many ways. And I think it's time for a new narrative about Africa. And I think the business story that comes out of there is, is a very good platform for that new narrative to, to develop. Alice, is that story oil, oil and not tomatoes? <laughs> um, yes, that's what I, I would like because they, if, if you notice, my, my thesis was on people. The people are the key. Investment in people is key for me. So those women who are the engine room of the development and a lot of the growth you've seen, a lot of it comes from such people and such um, organizations and areas. You'll find that those ones are the ones that really matter. The natural resources, there was no need to go back there because a lot of us know about 
Africa's natural resources, solid and uh, and uh, solid minerals, and then of course the oil and gas. That's that's basic. But we are looking at other areas where the development could come. Diversification of the economy is one of the major issues for Africa. So that's why I that area is very very key to me, and it's one of the areas that gradual change is coming. It's not. Compared to what is going on in the economy, actually, I'm yeah. not looking what they're doing, but it is chicken feed. No, it's not, because most of the time it is those ones, the the, the, the resources that come from the, the big money making. Um, when you get money from those big resources, it doesn't percolate so much to those ones. The poverty level is still very high, because many of those at those levels really don't get access to that. So that's what I'm saying. Okay, hang on. We're going to come out for another no, 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 round of no. questions. So. I, I, like, I like such questions because that's really what this is all about. It's important that we, we understand that. Most of people at the levels we are talking about don't have access to the big money. So that little money, what seems little to us, to them is their whole life. And if there's more like that across the board, you will find that many people will be lifted out of poverty much more than the big money would do. I'm so very that's sorry, I'm I will disagree. I will completely, yeah. completely, completely disagree with that. <laughs> Microfinance make women in Africa poorer, okay? Take it from me. It makes them poorer and poorer and poorer. Mm -hmm. What we need to do, we give them a seed capital. The women I didn't call it microfinance, you notice. No, I'm that's talking about micro, so it's a seed capital they need. Those women right now, for example, in Nigeria or in Dakar, what they need is seed capital. If you give them the microfinances, what they're going to do, their husband will go and buy TV, put them into their houses, <laughs> and they will start back. Take, take it from me. So we need seed capital for these women, not microfinance. So, uh, that's semantic. Well, seed yeah, capital, I, think, I think we're having a semantic yeah, well, debate only here. I mean... 80 or 90 percent of microfinance clients in Africa are women. A lot of them are in self-help groups, as Alice said, and that's been shown to work because it's solidarity, it's empowering. Well, these are, I mean, there's, there's plenty of uh, evidence of this. There's no I mean, evidence. There's see, no evidence. There is no evidence. Look at the Grameen Bank. Look at what the look, look, look at what the Grameen Bank did in Nairobi, for example. Look what they did in Nairobi, there for are, example. Well, are, look at what they did in Kibera. There in are Kibera. RCTs being conducted all over the world that are trying to measure the impact. There's a huge difference between Compatamas in Mexico, between a village savings and loan NGO in Central Africa. You can't generalize. It's also crucial is the provision of deposit taking, the ability to keep savings and not just credit. It's about whether interest rates are transparent, whether it's tagged onto education as well. So the, the answer not whether microfinance works or not in Africa is whether it can work, and the answer is some of the time uh, very well. I mean, uh, by seed capital, if you mean microenterprise loans to start, uh, someone has an idea and they want to grow their business, I mean, most that would fit within most people's definition of microfinance anyway. It was built on microenterprise. We need to look at we need to look at the thing at the wide range. Microfinance is making the women in Africa poorer, and I can prove that. Well, I, 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 I've conducted two or three hundred interviews with African women who would say otherwise as well. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, microfinance is neither here nor there, as the yeah. name, is the name uh, gives away. Um, the big scale things are what we need to look at. And you can make an argument, if, and if this is what I understand the point um, from the middle being made, is uh, all this is just happening due to Chinese demand for African uh, natural resources. And when that goes away, where will you be uh, with some mobile phones and uh, some microfinance? And that's not very good. I think, I mean, people don't apply that sort of argument to Saudi Arabia, right, which has made, um, you know, used its natural resources and transformed itself and is no longer dependent on them, uh, is one thing to remember. Um, also, food uh, production in Africa doesn't need to be a problem for it, and neither does famine as it happens, if it increases the level of productivity in the economy. So 40% of cashews or something are, are grown in Africa, but only 10% of them are processed. That happens elsewhere, right? Mm -hmm. So if you increase uh, the level of machinery and invest, uh, then you can get more out of what you've already got. So those are important things uh, uh, to remember, and not to take on and internalize I think you just can't discount what the West is saying and ignore it because there is the danger of these arguments being internalized because they're so very powerful uh, wor worldwide. You have to ignore that. I like your idea of reducing the collateral damage. I think, yes, you can use uh, revenues from uh, resource production to provide uh, a kind of safety nets for people as they transition out of subsistence farming I into new jobs. Absolutely, I think that should be done. Nobody wants to be uh, uh, cruel and heartless about this. But the thing, the main point is that you can 
uh, transform uh, economically uh, and reach a, a new level uh, of the economy. And that's uh, not to be set aside uh, as anything. Just to finish on that, there's a lovely process of uh, role reversal and reverse colonization going on with Angola and Portugal. I don't know if anybody's picked up on this. Mm -hmm. Not only have 100,000 Portuguese moved to its former colony to live in Angola and Luanda, but uh, the, Port the Angolan government has a hit list of what it's going to buy up uh, in Portugal. Not just banks, <laughs> right, but um, gas companies, uh, the state energy firm Galp. Uh, in Portugal may be bought up by Angola, its former uh, colony, which does have a line uh, on extensive credit uh, and can do that. So it's not necessarily going to be tied down to, in fact, it's got lots of oil forever. It may be buying up uh, quite a lot of uh, European assets, which again, we know are going to be going quite cheap these days, a fire sale uh, not too far away. Okay, and uh, we're going to have a really, really quick round of questions, so please do keep it brief. We can start at the back there, uh, the woman in the colourful shirt. We did talk about microfinances, but I have heard of other projects which have been taking place in Africa recently. For example, the Desertec project, a project using solar energy and creating massively cheap energy in the future, which is a wonderful project I suppose Europe could learn from. I mean, I come from a country which is increasing energy costs, Germany closing down atomic power stations, and it's just, you know putting its money into solar energy, which will never work in a country like Germany. It's too cold, I can assure you, but in Africa it probably has a future. I've just recently heard uh, a Harvard professor talking about, a Harvard professor from Ghana, Accra, unfortunately I forgot his name, about huge plans of um, irrigation uh, methods for Africa to um, increase agricultural production, saying Africa could become an agricultural exporter and no longer an importer. And it sounded very, very viable to me. So question, why are we not talking about these projects? Last point, I was interested, Alice saying, um, Africa lacks leaders. There was a time when I really envied Africa for its leaders. I mean, Jomo Kenyatta, uh, Nelson Mandela, I mean, you know, all these people, uh, Steve Biko, these were people who didn't parrot what the West was saying. They had their own ideas and their own visions. And right. I think these people are there. Given um, the intellectual and social capital that has been acquired by young Africans in diaspora, and also back in Africa, especially in Nigeria, um, how do you go about changing the stereotypes um, back home that young people are not capable of leadership? Um, and what would it take to actually do that? There seems to be a fair amount of agreement that the, the way that the West is intervening in Africa isn't, uh, isn't helping and maybe holding it back and certainly isn't allowing the full potential to be realised. Uh, I wonder what the panel think about the, uh, the intervention and the investment from China, um, whether, because you know, we've seen huge investment in industry and infrastructure from, from the Chinese and whether we think this is a, a much better thing for Africa. I was going to actually make a point about China as well, because what's interesting is the way China's being criticized for its colonial policy in Africa, right? And the main criticism seems to be that China doesn't ask any questions about the politics. It doesn't interfere with the politicians, right? It doesn't preach to them. It just gets on with the business of investment and I would think, from Africa's point of view, the development of infrastructure is probably going to come from the Chinese. Sure, they may like to get hold of Africa's mineral resources and so forth, but my guess is actually they will set up processing plants mm. in Africa because that will actually be much more efficient. Mariam, if you want to take that, specifically that question first. I'm just going to ask the, wanna... yeah, the gentleman was talking about the defeat earlier. So defeat China is quite interesting, actually, to have those two elements. Africa, like I said at the, on the Andrew Mao show, Africa is the hottest date in town right now, okay? Everybody's talking about Africa. Now, China is building, uh, you know, buildings, infrastructure in Africa, in Nigeria, in Tanzania, Ethiopia, everywhere you go, they're building this. What we need right now in Africa is those infrastructures, right? We need them, okay? So China, Africa, you know, it's going to happen anyway. The West like it, they don't like it, it's going to happen anyway. I don't agree with everything China does, but it's okay. We need this right now in Africa. Stop when you're in Dakar, try to tra travel to Kaulak and the roads are not doing well. If Chinese people come and say to you, can I build your roads, you're going to take that. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the PR about Africa. The reason why it's lacking, we need a good PR for Africa, is because West Africa, for example, with the French, the way, because we were colonized by French people, okay? Now, 
people are not investing into West Africa. You know, they're not investing in there. So it's very slow in West Africa because we don't have the good PR in West Africa. People don't know what's happening. So people lack confidence. The, the government lack confidence. People don't know what's happening. Systems are stagnant in West Africa. That's why we need to start talking about the good stuff that happened in Nigeria, for example, in, in Dakar, in other countries. So then we can have this, this good PR, this good stuff happening there. Okay? That's number one. The aid, for me, the aid, Africa doesn't need aid right now. Reverse aid, by the way. That's why I'm calling your staff Angola to Portugal. So it's the reverse aid. Now, African governments are investing into the West. For me, my point is, the, we need to start really looking Africa as a partner, okay, as a partner, rather than just trying to give solution to Africa. And what the, the British government does, for example, in Rwanda, they just kind of like, like the Tony Blair Foundation, they go and try to tell Africa, by the way, this is the right stuff to do, we are fantastic, we are your friend, let's do it together, okay? This will not help Africa. Now we are mature. African people are mature. Nigerian people, they're absolutely mature. Corruption, is, we have that in the UK as well. There's no corruption in Nigeria, but because there are the women in the government who are changing this. There's a woman in the government in Nigeria. She's changing this. I'm going to Nigeria next week. There is no corruption in Nigeria, like in, in the UK. Okay? There is no. Okay? Even if there is, it doesn't matter anymore. Africans could do uh, worse than tear up the Millennium Development Goals for a start uh, from, from the UN. The idea that it should limit its ambitions by 2015 to halving the number of people uh, living on less than a dollar a day, right? That must be the world's uh, least ambitious target ever. Uh, so Africans could uh, uh, rewrite a new one, take some confidence maybe in the relative decline of Western influence, certainly in the Arab uh, part of, of Africa, but more generally. Um, take advantage of the space created by uh, the emergence of China and the relative decline of the West. Uh, thirdly, argue for unsustainable development uh, at all times. And maybe just remember that you know, man came from Africa and that may be his future too. Mm -hmm. okay. Christine? Um, I think I just want to touch on the point um, you raised about um, the UK and the UN and are they holding back um, development in Africa? I think that's quite a nuanced um, deba debate, really. And, you know, I, I would say, you know, we can look at these issues of, you know, what has what aid done for Africa and so on. But I, I think, and I can say this from, you know, business perspective, um, we've actually been very impressed with what the Department for International Development is doing um, about trying to transform the, the narrative around um, aid and, and business in Africa. And definitely, I think what they're doing in terms of positioning business as the engine for development in Africa, and this narrative that's coming through here, I think is very indicative of how the debate has moved away from aid and it's looking more at investment and how the private sector is the engine for development in Africa. So I think there's a lot of colonial and historical issues that, that come from a question like that. But, you know, looking forward, and I think that's what we should be doing, and I think that's what a debate like this is, is trying to do, is that the Department for International Development, and it's something that we support, is doing a lot to position business and investment at the heart of growth in Africa. And I think economic growth is what is going to lift people out of jobs. It's what's going to stimulate and keep this, this growth of the middle class going. And I think that's the kind of thing that we need to focus on in terms of looking forward. And I think one of the issues with Africa has always been that we tend to go back to an old debate and we should try to move things, things forward. Okay. The young Africans in diaspora really excite me because that's a pool where what I'm talking about can come from. They're there, they're savvy, they, they, they know what they want, they know what's good for Africa, and they have all the story about Africa being outside Africa. So they are good. I'll give an example of how they can really change things in Africa. In Nigeria, during the last elections, I don't know if you are following, you had young Nigerians using social media to turn things around. I don't know how many of you are following that. Mm. The president, the current president of Nigeria announced his candidacy on Facebook. How many, how many people are aware of that? Mm. And, yeah, on Facebook, sorry, on, on social media, you had people pressurize all those who are going to go into the contest, have a debate. Doesn't happen. Before now, you had only the, probably the state media arranging something, usually for the favored candidate. But you had the social media used to force the candidates to have a debate. It happened. I was in Nigeria at that time, and I was watching this. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Various people were asked to come debate, 
And from there, I just watch him saying, this is what, what's he talking about? Even those you will think would be able to. So what I'm saying is, that group is a very good and formidable group that this leadership pool I'm talking about can come from. And the perception that the young ones cannot do anything is wrong. I don't agree with it. And I know many others who don't. But this is where civil education I'm talking about comes in. And this is where this group can use that kind of pressure to change things around. And I'm beginning to see that also happening gradually in government, where some in government are quite young, different generation from the usual 70s and above generation. So it's possible, and it's a good pool to get that leadership um, I'm talking about for, uh, for Nigeria, at least we're looking at Nigeria now, but even across Africa. It's great. And the African Leadership Academy I mentioned is doing something like that, taking very young people from across board, across Africa, those in refugee camps. Doesn't matter your status in life, doesn't matter your situation in life. They just look at the things you can do. I, I, one of the things he said was, if you needed to have a school, and even in the refugee camp, you had somebody go start how to build that school instead of looking for who to do it. That's the kind of thing they look for. Courage, passion for the country, passion for the environment, to be able to change things around. Those are the kinds of things we're looking for. And if we have that, I don't care about the rhetoric we talk about. I'm an African, I'm Nigerian, I know what I'm talking about. Whatever is fashionable out here in the West, that is not good to talk about corruption, it's good to talk about corruption. What are we talking about? We should talk about it. There is corruption in Nigeria. So we can't say there's no corruption. It would, be, it would be an ostrich style to put our heads in the sand. But what I'm saying is we shouldn't allow that to color everything else. We should talk about the wrong things, and that is the way we can change things around. And if we talk about them, then we don't feel insulted when others talk about them. Okay, very quickly. Um, I had dinner with the Ghanaian finance minister in Accra a couple of months ago, and he told me three things that actually touch on about three of the different points that have been brought up. The first is he listed all the Chinese investments in infrastructure. He said that the one thing we're missing are the, the rail, the roads, the processing plants that we need to just accelerate away, and Ghana's a big success story. And he said basically, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but thank God for the Chinese. Um, the second is he said that within three to five years, expects uh, Ghana to be a net food exporter. Cocoa in the north, uh, cotton in, uh, uh, mangoes in the coastal areas because of <coughs> temperature, nutrition, I can't remember the detail, but he said that that's the realistic aspiration. And the third is that, um, as you may know, um, they, they discovered oil off the coast of Ghana uh, uh, about three years ago, and they've just now are starting pumping. But before even a penny uh, arrived in the state coffers, they had a bill in place, uh, a law actually, it was passed, that accounted for where every cent of oil revenues would go, and it would go into infrastructure, education, and this was an impressive list. This was the kind of list you would design if you thought, right, how do we... Uh, how do we make things better? Um, and on the last subject of corrupt, uh, corrupt babble, I mean, you know, yes, we have to recognize that Nigeria has had 300 billion US dollars in oil revenue since 1971 and still has half the population under $2 a day. It would be ostrich, uh, as uh, Alice said, to not accept that. But the dialogue, the narrative has to be, how do you, how do we move on? Can we please have a huge round of applause for our speakers? Thank <laughs> you.